Hi everyone, my name is Lamia Al-Momani, and this is my friend Muhammad Al-Aqil. We are presenting today student perception in technology needs. So the needs of technology is increased day after day. And yes, we must use the advantage of technology and implement them effectively and efficiently. The way we are using the technology and the way we fulfill the needs is the hardest part of all. So in November 2015, we took a course with our wonderful professor, Anthony Petros. It was research and theory on communication and performance, which was explore more about how to conduct the research, the procedures, and how to make and cover a survey for a big number of people. And so, Professor Anthony Petros, he asked us to suggest a topic for a research. And I came up with the idea because I have already a questions about the technology services that we need as students inside the campus. So I suggest, what about we conduct a research about student perception in technology needs? And so we can fulfill the services we have so it can cover the whole needs for the students. And because I was a pretty curious about some issues, Wi-Fi's and smart boards, I find like this is the chance I have to take it. And our professor, he like encouraged us and he just pointed to the right people that can help us and support with our questions and with our, like the whole process for the, the research. And because the users, we already have them in, inside the campus, which are the students, who can decide the type of the service and who can, who can like basically need that service. And we have also the professional people who is Romain, who can cover the needs of those students. And so, Professor Anthony help us and tell us about the right people who can interview also, which is Jenica and Raymond too, we interview with them. And we had so many feedbacks, amounts of feedbacks actually, that support the whole research. So we start our research with putting the, the whole questions with, that covers 58 students, we got responded, and then that cover all these counties and we can see the counties are different and most of them the last one which is Sergio searches so yep <laughs> sorry for that okay so did I do oh, okay and so we start for the whole student of Sony Potsdam inside the campus for different majors. And we start putting and establish the questions and the questions was opening another new questions. Oh, sorry. And so we start doing the interviews. It was Skype with uh, Raymond and face to face with Romain and Jenica. And we start putting the survey monkey questions, which is the survey online survey. And also we did a food um, invitation for the student to make also to help us make more surveys. We did face-to-face -face surveys in the union, and we got so many responded and many comments. Many surprises comments, many funny comments also. And so, we're going to start part two with my friends, Muhammad Al-Aqil, which is some of the questions that our survey covered. The 
Merci. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, uh, first a question uh, we asked about the Wi-Fi services. Uh, that this is a big thing in school, and most of people complain about this, and that's why we ask this question. So, we got 46% of the students satisfied, and they are like happy with the service, but not all of them, because you know, sometimes the system and the Wi Fi get down, and Romain may, <laughs> may help us with that. Let's jump to the next question, which is the smart boards. <clears throat> most generally, uh, most, of, most of students are satisfied with smart boards, but the faculty, I'm sure they are not. And we can refer that question to Romain, and he can like, tell us about the, the, the faculty and how are they, how, how their satisfaction with the smart boards. Uh, scanners. Uh, this thing, we don't have that much of scanners in school, but this is okay. So, because anyone can do and scan the paper you, by using the device, the, I mean the students, they can scan by using their devices. So, there's no need to be in a line and waiting for, for, to, waiting, waiting for your turn to scan like three to for papers, so you can do it by your phone and just send it to your email as a PDF and just print it from anywhere in school. Uh, printing. This is, we had, we, we had like some comments from the students about printing. But generally, most of the students are satisfied with printing, but most of, the thing, most of the thing that they complained about is uh, the last two weeks of the semester, because they be, cause that was, that's what they told us, that they're like a big lines in, in, in the library, they are waiting for their turn to print out their paper. Uh, the public computing facilita facilitators is <clears throat> 56 of the students are uh, generally uh, satisfied, uh, but with this, with this, like we don't have, we don't have like much of computing, uh, public computing in the departments, uh, and also in the library we have a lack of computing. Smart classrooms. Well. 44 of the students, they are satisfied. And again, I'm sure that if we ask Romain, and he can tell us about the faculty, and we are sure that they are not satisfied with the, classroom, with the smart classrooms. Because some, I would say most of classrooms had like, have, have the lack of technology, and we just need like, to put more technology in the classrooms to help the to help the instructors to give their best for the students. So this is my part, and thank you so much for paying attention. And you still can take a look to our papers, also for more details about the whole questions and some comments some comments about the whole research, and some charts, a good chart actually, which is done in Illustrator, and it's very clear, so you can go through.
So yeah, if you have any questions, and it has all the details about the whole questions that we ask and we conduct. Thank you. If you have any question, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, just, just a couple of comments, uh, as, as she mentioned along the way. Um, uh, one of the things I, uh, I want to mention, you said uh, when you uh, surveyed the students about scanners, you had quite a few uh, that didn't even know what a flatbed scanner was. They'd never, they'd never used one. I, I thought that was pretty hilarious, actually. But as, as they said, a lot of them just, they just use their phone if they need to make a copy of something. I do that myself nowadays. And there are even scanner apps that make three passes. And, and, and anyway. That, that's happened with the Muhammad, actually. Like, you can go on it and give it to them also about the world. If you want. <laughs> well, I skipped that story because oh. I don't know. <laughs> OK, so. We were doing the, the, the survey on the union. We sat at a table, and most of, you, most of students, they were stopped by, and just, we, we were using our laptop. And by the way, the system was down. I mean, the Wi-Fi system was down, so. <laughs> so that's why we used our laptop. So that, that guy, he just came to me, and he said, OK, uh, what do you want me to do? I was like, I was explaining him the whole thing, like, we have a survey, and we, if you can help us with doing this and that. And he was like, he agreed to do the survey. And suddenly he just, he reached, he did the whole survey till he reached the, 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 the question about the scanners. And he just stopped for a second. And then he just asked me this, what is the scanners? I was... Honestly, for the first thing, I got shocked, and I couldn't like, answer him. I was like, what, what do you mean by what is a scanner? He was like, could you please explain me what does scanners mean? I was like, I was shocked. I, th I thought he's, he's just joking me or so, do, do something. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just, I talk, I start talk, I, I just explained to him the, the whole thing. And by the end of the conversation, he didn't like, understand the, the concept of the scanners, and he just like he was he was asking me like to what to pick from the from the choices, and I was like, it's okay, it's 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 your choice to, to choose whatever you want, and then he just like leave it empty, and he didn't like choose anything, and so <laughs> that's the whole story about the scanners. Uh, I also wanted to comment, uh, we'll get to questions in just a sec, I just want to comment on the, st the state of our network. Uh, the, the timing of their survey was um, uh, interesting in that over the, the l late last summer and into fall, we, we did two major things here on this campus. Uh, number one, we did a forklift upgrade of our campus wireless infrastructure, which is now, I'm very happy to say, what uh, the vendor calls stadium grade. I mean, you look behind you, there, there are two access points here in this room alone. We went from about 120 access points giving spotty at best coverage in our academic quad to over 600. And uh, now there might be a bathroom or two where you won't get signal, but everywhere else is, is, is pretty much covered. Uh, the other thing we did was uh, we contracted with Apogee for um, internet service in our residence halls which was uh, an absolutely wonderful thing to do. The previous vendor, who shall re remain nameless, uh, just really wasn't getting it done. And so uh, those two things happened at almost the same time. And so some of the students' perceptions about uh, Wi-Fi and whatnot uh, uh, may uh, be re a reflection of their previous experience. I would very much like uh, for a future class, say in two years, to do a, a similar project to what uh, Lamy and Mohammed have done to see how their perceptions have, have changed since then. Projection rooms, you can never have enough projection rooms. Until they're all projection rooms, there won't be enough projection rooms. And when they're all projection rooms, there won't be enough rooms. Uh, so uh, we keep trying to add and improve. Uh, anecdotally, I don't know what things are like on your campuses, but almost none of our projection rooms have anybody in them at 8 o'clock in the morning. So uh, do we not have enough projection rooms or do we need to look at our scheduling template? That's probably a whole different roundtable discussion. But uh, so, uh, are there any questions?
question was, are there uh, uh, differences between, or were there differences in the attitudes of the technology uh, of the printing itself versus the availability of being able to print, and do we charge for printing? Um, on the, I'll answer the question about the charges, and you can respond to the other thing. Uh, as part of their student technology fee for the uh, printers that we account for, which are principally in the library and the various hands-on computer labs that we have around campus, students are afforded 200 pages per semester uh, that they can print with, without incurring any charge. Uh, a color page is uh, three times a black and white page. After that, it's, um, it's a nickel a page. Uh, with the same equation, a, a color copy is three black and whites, and that just goes on their bill at the end of the semester. Um, so that answers the question of charging. Now for the, like the printing in general, it was something we are curious about because when we like stand by the library, we want to print, we have to wait in like a line to print. So. It was more about to know if there is any more other devices that we can have as students so we can't stand in the line and wait for it to print. And Jenica was suggested to also offer a new service and to ask the students if they want to have it, which is the third party printing yeah, system. Ah, right. Um, so, uh, Jenica Rogers is our uh, director of libraries, just to clarify that. And um, we have four black and white laser printers and a color printer in the library. And they, they all, it's round robin, they come out, you know, one print, and, it, and that's largely for redundancy, so that if one printer goes down, we still have three. But we could have eight or ten printers there, and the last, you know, the day before finals are due, there's still going to be a line. So, we, we all know that. But uh, the service that, that uh, she's talking about is something like WIPA, if, if you've heard of that. Uh, basically, cloud-based printing, where the print company provides a kiosk or kiosks for you, and it, it can tie into your campus meal card system, and they can print from any device they have. There's a phone client, a tablet client. You can print from your computer up to their cloud service, and then you can go to any of their print release stations, which is basically a laser printer in a box on a monitor with a card swipe. You walk up, you swipe your card, it says, oh, these are the jobs you have, which one do you want here at this kiosk? And it's also, a, it's a printer on a big massive stack of paper and, and it prints it right there for you. So you could deploy those in your library, you could deploy them in the residence halls, in your student union. How neat would it be to come out in the morning and on your way to class, just stop in the lobby of your residence hall and pick up your paper? Because you could do that. So there are several companies doing that right now. Um, I, I, Weep is the only one that comes to mind, but I know there are at least three others. And they all operate on the same model. And if you choose to subsidize your student printing, you could work with those companies uh, to, to, to arrange that. You know the. For us, it was 200 pages, so uh, we would get a bill for the first 200 pages that I, all the students did, and then it would be on them after that. Or you can just say, we're offering you this printing. If you want this other service, you can use that, uh, but that's all on you. It's a, it's, there's no cost to the campus to get these kiosks because they make their money directly from the students by charging them for the printing. The only thing you have to be is a steward of the uh, kiosk and keep it full of toner and paper which they send to you as part of the service. So it's something to look into. Um, um, uh, the last time I looked into it, the question is, uh, do, do we get a, a, a kickback or payment from the, the company for that service? Um, I think there is, a, there is a way to do that. So maybe you charge six cents a copy and keep a penny, uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, it's been a while since I talked to one of the vendors about that, but there are possibilities in that area, I'm very sure. Uh, Laura?
The question was, uh, if uh, the students were polled about smart boards, uh, if a faculty member had been asked about uh, a smart board, this faculty member in particular, she wouldn't have known what a smart board was. Hadn't seen one since she was in a high school and not seen one on this campus. Uh, we do have several rooms with smart boards in them uh, here, but they're usually installed in places where somebody has asked for a smart board most notably in teacher education uh, and the Crane School of Music, where they make use of them uh, as part of their curriculum for training teachers. Uh, we do have, in fact, one of the teacher ed faculty is uh, smart certified uh, by the, the smart board company and uh, uh, makes uh, heavy use of them. Would you like to add something? Like for me, I believe the instructor is the one who can decide whether to use the smart board or not. It's nice even for the instructor, even if the major, the whole major wasn't, has any relationship with the technology, it's nice to use and engage the technology inside the class. So it's basically with depends and counts on the instructor. And it's so easy, technology, they love it. Like all the students, they love to use technology. It is an interesting uh, dichotomy because you have students who've come from a K-12 environment where almost all of the teachers are using technology like this in, uh, in their K-12 classrooms and then they get to college and I think a lot of us are still playing catch up with that. I don't know about any of you but you know our local school district in some ways is better equipped in their, all of their classrooms than many of our classrooms are and so you know in particular, being a teacher college, uh, we know we, we need to have the, the technology here that they're going to be teaching with when they get to their K-12 environment as teachers. But what about the rest of the, the, the faculty? And how many other classrooms should we equip with this? And then we struggle with issues of uh, faculty training, who's gonna show them how to use all of this? Uh, that sort of thing, uh, advocating for it, convincing them that it's something that they, you know, may want to take advantage of. Question is: Is there is there a plan uh, here at SUNY Potsdam specifically to to uh, better equip more classrooms? Uh, and we can have a longer discussion about that at some point. But in general, uh, historically, uh, CTS uh, Computing Technology Services here has been largely reactive to to requests about uh, things like smarter classrooms. We now have uh, three academic programs vying for rooms with more computers in them. And uh, what it's coming down to now is a, a question of, uh, well, resources, like always. Money, who's going to pay for these, and, and the saturation. And we're starting to have to have those conversations because um, we're starting to get tapped out, you know, with our budget, with, with network upgrades and server upgrades. And uh, we already equip a large swath of classrooms, and we've gotten to the point where okay, it's the end of the year, we don't have money for more computers, so where's that going to come from? And uh, so the point is, uh, many faculty are making do with BYOD, uh, knowing that they're in a room that's not well equipped, they bring their own technology to. Record with whiteboard apps, et cetera, et cetera. You can mimic the functionality of tech that's absent with the stuff you bring yourself. Yeah. Way in the back. Yep, that's you. <laughs> Do, do students bring their, uh, their own technology around to the classrooms, or do they make use of what's provided by the campus? Actually, we ask about that questions, like literally, we ask them, do you prefer to use your own laptop or the desktop? And the percentage is shocking. There is lots of number of students who increased using the laptops, their own devices. And there's lots of comments. 
Uh, my own comment on that is uh, the, the, the BYOD uh, phenomenon is, is, is growing, uh, but if the campus owns uh, you know, particular software for a curriculum, it's often uh, only provided on the campus-owned computers. Not everything is licensed for student use, and even if it is, we get into logistics about how it gets distributed and, and maintained. Um, and so that's something my area is, is continually thinking about and looking at. You know, are we getting to the point now where our infrastructure is robust enough to provide a virtual desktop that students can remote into with their own uh, systems? And if that's the case, if we can move toward that, that might be a way toward accomplishing equipping other classrooms. If we can tear out a couple of hands-on computer classrooms because people can accomplish that with their own devices by remoting into a virtual desktop then that might free up other resources that we don't need to implement in that manner and do something else that way. So. This is Tony Beatrice. Hey guys. So to jump in on this question, we did a survey about four years ago and uh, student laptop saturation was higher um, about four or five years ago. It was in the 98 to 99 percent. So if you ask students five years ago, everybody had a laptop. But you can probably guess what's happened is they now have maybe an iPhone 6S or a new Galaxy Tab or some sort of tablet, and they basically say, I don't really need a laptop because now I can use the campus technology services labs. So in, in a sense, the demand for public computing facilities may have increased recently because they don't necessarily have it, and that's reflected in this question. So interesting trend there. Um, you sort of have to pair it with a device question to see where the technology really is. Uh, the question is, what about their survey surprised them? Well, one, like, basically the all complaining. And it's so surprising for me to read their comments. It was like, I think the time, picking the time was so funny because when we, when they was writing their comments, some of them, they, Wi-Fi? Yeah. And they, <laughs> They just, like we was like a sponge observe their tensions at like they really had so much funny comments and that's really surprising me and it's surprising that some instructors and they didn't use the technology which is the smart board they know that this generation is the generation of the technology but they still not using the smart boards and technologies and engaging them in their class. Like that. Well, uh, for me, one of the things that, that, shocked, that shocked me is the number of the participants. I, 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 was, I, I was willing to get more students, to get like big number. But uh, I mean, just we, we did this in the last month uh, in November. 2015, so yeah, so most, most people, I think they were like paying attention for like doing their stuff more than like stop by and do a survey. And also we sent Tony Petrus, uh, Professor Tony Petrus, he, he sent out this, the, the, the survey on like for, for I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know how many students, if you, 1,200 and so but the number is, I mean, this is the, the thing that, that I, yeah, it's, it's fair, but I, I, I was willing to get like more participants. Yeah. Um, so, what are you, what were you to do with the question is, uh, what, what do they plan to do with the results? Actually, like, Basically, my curiosity was when I was thinking of any institution in the whole world, if we really cover the needs, basically, it's gonna like, all, we're gonna take all the advantages from the technology. If we are covering, covering the right needs, and you, that, that's the way that we're gonna use it in a right way. And that's, we like, as an institution, in that way, it's going to have the advantage of the technology. But 
if it, it was two baths, they are separately and there is no, no match at all, then there's going to be some other issues like some workers, they don't like to work anymore. There is no passion for the students or for the workers in general. So there is many things is hidden behind covering the needs for the users. That's for me. Would you like that? For the survey, uh, first of all, we did it with Romain, and he he's he's one of the people who suggested some of question or some of the questions. Uh, because of the city as department, they want to know about a, a couple of things like the, the using of the laptops and printing machines and these things. But, I mean, getting these results and just deliver it to Romain, uh, I think this is what are we, 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 what we are doing and, and what we are like supposed to do. So we just like take the, the, the I mean, the whole thing from the students and deliver it to the responsible. To, to, to handle the issue. Can I add something? Oh, yeah, please. One of the things that helped us and encouraged me so much to, to do all the passion behind the whole research was when I met you and you were so welcoming about the whole thing. Like, you said to me, this is the chance. I want that from a long time. And this is the chance we have to gain it. I am grateful for the data because I don't know what the students are like on your campuses, but we almost never hear from them as, as a service department. Uh, you know, I, I have student friends that I can tap from time to time and try and get my finger on the pulse of, of what they're feeling about the technology. But, you know, if they sit down at a computer and the keyboard doesn't work, they just move to the next computer. We don't even hear that the keyboard's broken until somebody in my department notices it or somebody else tells us. So, and this has historically been true. Um, you know, we, we've had uh, many times we've tried to get uh, active student involvement in our in our planning, and and uh, it just all seems to fall apart. And I think a lot of it has to do with the cyclic nature of students. You know, they're here for four years, they're gone. It's hard to get anybody invested in any long-term planning when, for them, it's all short-term. And and as our uh, backroom systems get smarter, and we can do analytics and see, okay, they just asked for a lab full of 20 computers and I can show that for the last semester, no more than 10 of them were ever in use at the same time. Okay, we can start making some data-driven decision making that makes sense and say, we don't need a room full of 20 computers in this location, we only need 12. We'll take the resources that are funding those eight and move them somewhere else. We can start doing things like that, but we also need the student feedback. What do they want? What do they expect? Because what their needs and expectations are as students aren't necessarily in line with what uh, the, the faculty are asking for in the classroom. It's fine that the, uh, you know, the professor is teaching with this one particular software package, but they need the infrastructure to support the devices they're using to get their work done, like their smartphones, which is why we had to upgrade our Wi-Fi. Everybody has four different things on them right now that use Wi-Fi, so we need their input to drive some of the decisions we make. The question was, is there any plan to do this as a yearly, sur yearly survey to gauge progress? Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Here. Um, in any case, there's a little bit of talk, maybe not every year, um, just to give you a, a sort of a frame of reference. I serve as the faculty athletic rep on campus, and I work with the other FARs around the SUNYAC comprehensives, um, the Cortlands Binghamtons, not the research centers, but the sort of peer institutions. Yeah, it, the comprehensive. So we do every four years a GPA study, and it tracks the GPAs of each of the teams across each of the campuses across semesters. So we look at in-season GPAs versus out-of-season GPAs to see if we can see SUNY-wide trends and we can kind of learn from each other. Um, it's really not to pick that, hey, my basketball team has a better GPA than your basketball team or, you know, if we were doing this sort of the logical 
thing here is to maybe do this at a SUNY level uh, and then sort of track campus-wide satisfaction. And then you can start tracking things like, well, this is a, a sort of a common service that's across all campuses. This is a unique thing on this campus. And what we found with the FAR survey is that the campuses started sharing best practices to both explain and improve what they did um, with the athletes, study halls, um, policies for when they had to uh, report from their instructor, basically the nuances of how a system runs. And I think it starts with a pilot test, and I think part of the reason we did the presentation here and Lamia and Mohammed were invited is we wanted to start a conversation about how this might happen, not just every couple of years at SUNY Potsdam, but possibly every X number of years periodically at the SUNY level. It's not a terribly complicated process to do. The survey itself is a simple survey, um, but the results, as they found, can be quite surprising once you start tapping into the students. And then you have to filter through some of the angst that they might have. So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, yes, we're looking to conduct this in the future, um, either at the local level or the SUNY level. And I, I think it's also important to, to note that you know this is a, a student, uh, uh, for want of a better term, a needs assessment uh, versus a satisfaction survey, which we already do at the at the system level. I mean, that's how we come out with things like our president touting we're number one in food service. How do we know that? Because the students were surveyed about food service and technology and other things. We, we already get that information, but this is different. This is asking them how they feel, not, not only how they feel about what they have, but, but what, do they, what do they want? What would they like to see? Uh, and I'm not sure anybody's asking that yet. So, Hi. Where is this available? Where can they get this? If you contact us, like we can send the PDF file. So you can see. I'll just stop up. Stop up and grab a business card, and we also have it on a USB drive if you'd like to take it immediately on your laptop. So, either way. Yeah, we, we can post it. Too. Yes, we can make that happen. The uh, uh, question is, can we post it on the CIT site? If you have no problem with that, uh, I'll get a copy of their presentation, and yes, we'll post it up with all the other materials we're making available. Absolutely. Right, right here, we haven't heard from you. Thoughts on students making use of their own technology in the classroom? Uh, you mean instead of what's, uh, what's uh, being provided or in the absence of what's being provided or both? Or both. Um, I think there will be the number of the desktop inside the room devices, like it's gonna minimize, I think. But if we engaged activities in the desktop inside the room, just in them, maybe that will encourage them to use the, the desktops. Maybe. Would you like to add? Well, one, one of the things that, that I'm personally struggle with, checking my email, my peer mail. I don't like to go to just and give my laptop and just check my, my, my peer mail. But I like to have it on my phone, for example. And this is one of the things that we didn't talk about in the presentation, but we have this, is, we have this on the paper. So, for example, using, the, like using Gmail or using other like, uh, mail providers like the Outlook or any, any, any provider. So, Checking the email on, the, on, on your phone is much easier than like sitting and having a laptop and just checking your email from your laptop. So I think this is one of the things that I like about the research, which is because it supported my idea, so. <laughs> and yeah, that's very much it. Yeah?
Uh, thank you. The comment was a positive one about our Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> so that's been recorded. Thank you. Uh, the uh, yeah, the, the the default lease for the Wi-Fi is 24 hours. But in knowing that there were going to be close to 400 extra people here on campus, um, we decided to, to bump that up for five days, just so that you will, like in a hotel. You've been in a hotel, decide to stay up late. All of a sudden, it's 1 a.m. and you're kicked off the internet because it's one o'clock and everybody, all the leases get purged and everybody has to re-register. Our guest network is set up that way, but we have to be accommodating and so we didn't want that to be a hassle every morning for everybody, so we jacked it up. So it'll go back after you're all gone, but. Uh, the question has to do with uh, uh, the students' experience with professors who both promote and uh, 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 prohibit technology in the, in the classroom. Uh, before they comment, I'll just say, but back before our wireless was as robust as it is now, we, we would have uh, roughly equal number of requests from faculty who either A, wanted Wi-Fi in a classroom where it wasn't because they wanted to empower the students, and then the ones who we're, yes, we're in a classroom that had it and said, God, how do we turn it off so they can't use their stuff? Uh, so uh, we can't, well, we won't turn it off, but uh, that, that's just always been amusing to me, so. I think if we prohibited the whole thing, that won't, like, it's gonna affect them negatively, I believe so. Because now technology, iPhones, smart boards, and, and all the laptops, devices in general, they all become part of the characters more than like something that we can just use in the classroom and that's it. It's more about in their blood. So if you just say to, to, to the student, don't use it, that means like, don't focus with me at all. I want you just to get your attention to the thing that I said no to you. Like as a kid, when you say no, he's gonna focus more on the no thing. So I'm not that, with that issue at all. I'm with using technology because it's basically become, I mean, it's part of the character. Would you like to add? Well, for our department and uh, Dr. Anthony Peters is the dean of the department. Uh, chair? <laughs> okay. He's the chair of the department. <laughs> uh, he's, and and he's, he's one of the professors that I had like three classes with. So he always allow us to use the technology in a good way. Like not texting, or, but use it in, in, in education. And this is the, like the main thing in, in, in the educational technology specialist. We, may, we, we use the technology in education, so this is a big thing in, 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 like in our department. And we really like, in his class, we really, if I have even iPad, iPhone, whatever, like I totally focus with him because he, he put the fun with technology, with even the use of that, our phones, but still in the message of the education, which is the game that we, um, what's the game with the questions? Kahoot. So we use the phone, but in the, in the right path. And that's awesome from him. You are awesome. <laughs> so one over here. Is there any sense of uh, wanting on the part of the students for technology that they don't have and or we don't provide here on campus? 
Oh, well, no, we didn't like have that issues. Like, basically, like all of them is positive, which is like they cover the most of things that the student really needs. Some of the students they really like to use. Still, they like they insist to use devices and technology to download games and movies and. But still, like, I think the CTS people, they cover the whole programs and softwares that we really need as students. I mean, in some ways, this question is really for the faculty. Like, how do we use technology with the students? I mean, when it really comes down to it, we're the point of contact. We're modeling how that technology is used. So one of the questions we asked um, had to do with how do you prefer to learn to use the technology? And you can see the very top one. Let me see if I can zoom in a little. Um, they want it embedded in the classroom assignments. So that's number one. So they don't want some, well, you can see the other things. So yeah, a YouTube video is good. The training in the library is good. Uh, maybe some peer-to-peer -peer teaching, and we have some workshops that we deliver. So we've done this in various places where we'll have students deliver workshops to other students about how to use technology, and that's all good. But number one is they want the faculty to use the technology well and show them how to do it. So really this comes down to how are our, our faculty engaging in professional development. So in some ways it sort of teases out a little bit about maybe our own inadequacies as a faculty and, and how we need to overcome them. I can say even as a professor in a program where it's my job to teach people to use technology, I have trouble keeping up with things at times. So the first thing I have to do is just acknowledge that I don't know everything and I never will. And I never say, when somebody says, do you know how to do that? The first thing I say is, no, I don't, but I'd love for you to teach me. So every day when I'm in the classroom, I learn something new from my students. And if I have that back and forth, I think that the faculty can then sort of not just learn from each other, not just learn from Jenica in the library, I can say from personal experience, I learn the most from my students, and then fr from there, I can maybe share a little bit. And if we all learn from our students, I think we'd all be in a better place. Other questions? Sorry, you sort of addressed this already, but just out of curiosity, are, are there any plans to use this data in faculty training at all? Like, Are there any plans to use this data to, to uh, enhance faculty training uh, as a response to what the students have said they're, they're interested in? Is that a fair assessment of your question? Uh, here, on, here at SUNY Potsdam, we, we have, uh, uh, are just in the process of organizing uh, what uh, you'd call a faculty development center. We call it our Center for Creative Instruction. And uh, yes, I think it would be appropriate to feed the data from this survey to that group of people who are, they're, they're still trying to figure out how they're going to do what they've been charged with, but this is data that can fuel that mission. Uh, and, and part of it is asking faculty what are they interested in being taught more about, but also uh, the, the other part of that is making suggestions to them, knowing that we have information like this from the students this is what your students are expecting. Have you noticed that 80% of your students have a tablet or something in front of them? What are they doing with it? Do you think they're just texting? No, maybe they're using it as a tool to enhance their learning in your course. Maybe you should know more about why they're doing that and how they're doing that and helping them through that. Because not everybody is probably as comfortable as Tony is walking up to their own students and saying, please teach me. Um, and we need to be sensitive to that and maybe help them with that behind the scenes. Laura? I confess, I have long considered who we have in the classroom to say, okay, can you look up the date of where the conquest of England was? Can you check on the conjugation of this verb and check with that master of feminine? But I had no idea that I could incorporate a class activity and expect everyone or maybe the neighbor to have. Very nice. Laura's gone from banning technology in the classroom to embracing it. So. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, can, can professors reasonably expect that everybody's come packed with technology to their classes and uh, if it's not provided for them? I, I don't know if we're there yet. We must be, I don't know if we'll ever see 100%, maybe in some individual classes, but uh, you know, not everybody has the financial resources to equip themselves with thousands of dollars of technology uh, you know, between smart watches and smartphones and smart tablets and everything else. But like you said, uh, we're, we're getting more and more into you know areas of collaboration and whatnot. So you don't have one with you, buddy up, you know, with the person next to you if the curriculum allows for that. I guess. Uh, hi. Yep. Right. Uh, uh, this, uh, the commenter said that on the first day of class, she polls the students to find out how best to communicate with them. What would they prefer? And that way she doesn't have to make assumptions about, uh, uh, about uh, other ways of communicating that previously have worked, but uh, she knows how to best efficiently uh, communicate with them. Oh, not just email. Ask your students how, how do they learn best, right? Yeah, what do they tell you? <laughs> Google Docs, Google Drive, collaborative, working together. Tony's got a comment. Yeah, there's, a, there's three layers of data here. The presentation that you saw, the paper that's here, and then the, the spreadsheet that captures all of that. So in terms of a kind of a pyramid, everything's in the spreadsheet, most of it's in the paper, and some of it's in the presentation. And so one that didn't make it to either of these that you guys could comment about if you like, uh, is the preferred method. We asked, what way would you prefer to be contacted by professors? And so if you're, do you remember the results of that? Not the number exactly, but in general, they prefer to, like instructors, um, with their instructors, they use bare, bare meal. But with their beers, they use Gmail. Because for them, Gmail is as an application, you can get the notifications and everything in the iPhone. It's easier more than to just open the page with a Safari or any other uh, browsers. So it's easier for them to use Gmail. And some of them, some of the instructors, they don't mind to use Gmail, but they still use the peer mail, but they, they have options to use also the Gmail. One piece in there that we asked was, would you prefer to be contacted by SMS or text messaging? What do you think the answer to that was? No. Really? No, they wanted a demarcation. They wanted uh, bare mail to be the formal communication from the professor, which is interesting because I think if you asked that question five years ago, they would have, it seemed to me the, the feeling was, why can't you just text us with everything? And now it's like, well, I don't want you on my text messaging list. So, yeah. Uh, uh, let's go here first. Is your email on campus not Gmail? Is your email not? Yes, it is not Gmail. <laughs> right. We are in the throes of, uh, we're actually uh, very likely going with Office 365, uh, but we're not there yet. Oh, did it? Oh, <laughs> I was, there you go, it's official. Uh, uh, we, we have for years had a, a homegrown email environment. I mean, it is standards based, but it is not Google. It's not Office 365. It is, though well, they can, they can, they can set it up and get it on their phones. Uh, I will say most students aren't aware of that. Uh, they try and use the little web interface on their, on their phone, which is not mobile optimized, uh, which is one of the many reasons we're moving to something, uh, modern, uh, and, uh, uh, not homegrown. Uh, I could talk all day about that, but I'm not going to. Uh, how many of your 
We have about 45 classrooms uh, right now that have some form of technology in them. Most of them are uh, a projector with a dual boot uh, Windows or Mac computer uh, at the lectern with BYOD hookups for people who bring laptops. Uh, and that was, yeah, that's, I knew you were going to ask me that. Uh, overall instructional space, I don't know what the total number of classrooms are uh, on campus. I dare say we could easily build at least another 100 or 150 uh, and, and find places to do that uh, on this campus. So don't hold me to it, but m maybe a quarter, a little less. Uh, and like I said, it's, it, it's not enough. Uh, every, year, every semester there are struggles for finding a classroom. Right here. They don't respond to our survey either. The comment is that uh, just because you email them doesn't mean they're responding to your emails. They also didn't pay like some, at least $600 to uh, participate in the survey. Right. They do pay to participate in class. Uh, the, 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 the comment is that uh, students, uh, some students tend not to reply to professors, which I would imagine leaves the professors wondering, did they even get the email, uh, or, or let alone read it? Uh, one of the things, I know some campuses are getting away, or I've, at least I've heard, are getting away from even providing email for their students because they already come loaded for, for bear with, uh, with Gmail or Yahoo or, or something else. One of the reasons I think we have continued to do it is because we can guarantee delivery to their potsdam.edu mailbox. We can say, you got it, even if you didn't choose to read it. You're still responsible for the information. Once it leaves our campus, we don't know what Google did with it or Yahoo or whatever. There's no guarantee that it, I mean, they have plausible deniability. I never got that email, uh, but we can say, check our local logs and say, why, yes, you did. In fact, it's in your inbox. We can see it, you know, that kind of thing, and, and hold them accountable. Um, certainly not, uh, uh, yes. Yep. Recharging of devices. Uh, somebody asked, uh, we're, we're having our main lecture hall renovated right now. It's uh, year one of a two-year phase, I think. And I was asked at one point, uh, you know, we were told what they were planning to do, uh, windows, air ducts, things like that. And, uh, and we were asked, is there anything else we should do? And I said, yeah, electricity, everywhere. I mean, put it everywhere, put it around the seats, put it on, under the seats, uh, on the seats, somewhere where they can just sit there and plug in. Uh, it was part of the design of the new Performing Arts Center. You sit in the cafe there, in the base of the, uh, the, the booths, there's, there's power outlets. And uh, for me, it's a standing order to physical plant. Anytime you're doing renovation, if you think anybody might even just sit on the floor right there because it's a handy spot, put a power outlet there. Uh, if the wall's open, Pull a cable. Um, yeah, it's a problem. Uh, we're encountering it too. Portable recharging stations for ad hoc classrooms. It can be moved wherever they're needed. Right, having recharging in the classroom because they have back-to-back -back classes 
and the laptop battery, even your phone battery is going to die, especially if you're using it constantly throughout the class. Uh, students already have that problem, back-to-back -back classes. You get three classes in a row, uh, your battery's dead, unless there's some place you can get some juice for it. Potsdam specific question, yes. Uh, is our new Wi-Fi able to handle, say, 60 clients at a time? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. In, uh, in this room, I only saw those two uh, access points before. Well, there are two more, I just noticed. So uh, in this room alone, you, know, you, could, you could pack this room and have everybody with a, a, a phone and, a, and a, a laptop, and it would be fine. Way in the backpack. Commenters, uh, campus does Wi-Fi surveys to guarantee uh, the signal strength in a particular classroom uh, when a faculty has a question like the last one, is this room good enough for what I'm about to ask my students to do? Anything else? With all the technology at their disposal, students still crave paper. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Me. Well, uh, her. Yeah. <laughs> I would like, I still would like to read, revise. Like, it's like stuck here more than, for me, it's stuck here more with reading from the paper than seeing it and watching it. And, uh, smart screen and I just came up with the idea I don't know if we can do that or not but we used to do like in a school switching turns which is to be in one day in a string in the instructor place and instructor be as a student place so maybe in that way we can teach the instructor without letting him know that he's shamed that he did, he's not knowing about the technology. Maybe we can do that as like workshops, activities inside the class, as a way to teach him in indirect way. I don't know if they're gonna do that or not. What do you think, I mean, Tony? Do we assume that just because students have technology that they're capable of using it in a manner that uh, would enhance their education? Is that the question, basically? How do we orient our students to what's, what's provided as well as what they've brought with them and how they can make use of it? Um, our orientation session does include, uh, I mean, they get bombarded with so much information and orientation about the campus. Uh, we do get some time with them and we try and impress upon them the, the basics of, uh, you know, campus-based storage, never share your password, this is the printing and how it works, things like that. We don't have time for a deep dive in, into, in, into things like that. We rely on some q and I, I brought my phone, how do I get on the Wi-Fi, things like that. Uh, we, we will respond to, um, uh, you said you had a comment? Yeah, I'd say that uh, the students highly overestimate their technical abilities. Um, and digital literacy 
is still a divide. So there's still a significant digital literacy divide. So what we've done here is we've developed in our program with some of our other students a, a digital literacy course that we give to all of our students um, in the education program. So we maybe eventually that'll make its way campus-wide, but for now at least all of our ed students get the basic digital literacy course, which covers basically all the gaps that you have. You test out of the things you do know, and then the things you don't know you go through. So it's kind of, if you think of your own knowledge as probably spotty, I know mine was when I went through it, it fills in gaps. And I think everybody could benefit from some sort of basic digital literacy on every campus, whatever form that takes, because um, you have people, I mean, I, I could give you a hundred examples, but yesterday in class, I had a student who didn't know how to switch between applications on a Mac. And, and this is basic stuff. They didn't know that a, an application could be open but with the windows closed. Or, you know, people who may have 50 applications open on their phone and, and don't know how to close them. There's these, there's, there's a hundred or even a thousand basic things like this. So I try in my classes to learn two or three every day from my students. And every time I see that they need to know something, I try to teach them. And so it's like this ongoing, as they say, the first point of contact is the professor. So I try to do that. Um, if everybody could sort of get to that level, then we'd sort of all learn from each other. Um, not every class is necessarily set up in that way. But short answer, um, there's still huge gaps out there. Um, maybe even more profound than ever because now they're coming out of high school pretty much using their devices all the time, not necessarily even a laptop. So maybe even worse. when campus does reach out to their students uh, over the summer. Makes them aware of what they're coming into on campus, right. We're at 10 o'clock, folks. Uh, that's the scheduled end of this discussion. We have a half hour break before the uh, rest of the morning sessions get started. So uh, I'd like to bring this to a formal close, but stick around if you want to chat. I think Lamia and Mohammed will be here for a few minutes if you'd like to talk with them or get a copy of their presentation. And uh, thank you all very much.